Good morning and thanks for joining us on a special edition of TVC Breakfast. We have a bumper package for you today. You can watch us online. We're streaming live on YouTube and you can connect with us on Twitter using the hashtag TVC Breakfast. Now, as Nigeria celebrates 21 years of uninterrupted democratic rule, today marks five years of uh, the Muhammad Buhari administration. It has been a journey of challenges and victories for President Buhari and indeed Nigerians. Joining me via Skype from Abuja is uh, Special Advisor, Media and Publicity to President Muhammad Buhari, Mr. Femi Adishino. Good morning and thank you for joining us on TVC Breakfast. Thank you. Good morning. Happy May 29. Same to you. Five years, a journey of uh, victories and challenges. Talk us through how this journey has been. Yes, I'm glad I like that description. Victories and challenges. Of course, um, victories will not come unless challenges are first come. The challenges have been many and the victories have also been many. Uh, well, the, the administration came at a time of serious challenges in the country. The challenges were many. Security, social, economic, political, all sorts. So it was an administration born at a time of serious challenges for the country. And therefore, from day one, it was straight into tackling those challenges. You Recall that from his inauguration at the Eagle Square on May 29, 2015, the president directed that the, the, the epicenter of the reaction to the uh, Boko Haram insurgency must move to Maiduguri, that the service chiefs must move to the northeast right on the day it was inaugurated. That shows you that it was an administration born into security challenges. But we thank God five years later, the challenges have not disappeared, but they are not as daunting as they were five years ago. Other theaters of challenges have opened up. Banditry, for instance, was not part of the challenges we had as of May 29, it came in later. Cattle rustling became a serious issue. Herdsmen, farmers' clashes became a serious issue. Kidnapping had been there, but it went several notches higher. So you see that it was an administration that had to tackle a lot in terms of security. But today, those challenges, while they have not disappeared completely, are under some sort of control. The insurgency that we had grappled with in the Northeast since 2009, I think we are getting to the final days. It's not as it used to be. As our 2015, bombs went off every day, not once, not twice. Bomb went, bombs went off in different parts of the country. But now you hear of bombing few and far between, if it happens at all. And uh, the insurgents have been smoked out and they are running around like rats. And very soon we will get to the end of this way. Banditry is under control. It, they still rear their heads, but see how they are being taken out daily in their hundreds, in their hundreds. One day we will get to the end of it. That is uh, in the area of security. The government was also born into economic challenges. Don't forget that before 2015, oil prices went as high as $143 a barrel and it stabilized at $100 a barrel for a long time. And suddenly in 2015, it crashed going as low as $27 per barrel. And this is a country that has no other form of revenue except from oil. With prices at $27 per barrel, it became very challenging for government. But despite it, the government um, uh, trudged on. 2016, the economy went into recession. A year later, it came out of it, and the economy began to look up. Things were looking up until January this year economically, till COVID-19 came, another challenge, and we are grappling with it. The, the projection is that the economy may go into another recession this year, 
bothered by next year, it will come out of it. So you can see that it's a government that has been grappling with many challenges, but coming out victorious. On the social front, it inherited a badly fractured nation, badly fractured polity. Recall that the 2015 election was, was, was fought on several fronts. Religion was used, language was used, ethnicity was used, everything was used to fight that election. So the polity was fractured along those lines. Therefore, uh, uh, re re retooling the policy, getting the cohesion of the country back was a challenge. And that challenge we're still grappling with. So so we're succeeding the up reasons, to an extent uh, that Nigerians themselves If I may interrupt the, your line of thought, uh, Mr. The government uh, talked about diversification of the economy at some point during this uh, administration, but uh, the oil price has dropped, like you mentioned uh, earlier, and we see a disruption, so much so we had to review our budget. And so the question has big, uh, is uh, that uh, that actual diversification of the economy doesn't seem to be able to give us the needed cover, seeing that uh, the government put in so much effort. Why is that? You are looking at only one side, so only one side of the coin, and a coin usually will have two sides. Yes, revenue has dropped, but then you have not looked at what happened in agriculture. In 2015 November, the president launched what is called the Anchor Borrower Scheme, in which Nigerians were encouraged to go back to the farm. Money was made available for cultivation of rice, of maize, of cotton, of different kinds of greens. This is a country that used to spend $3 billion annually in importing rice. There was a time we were importing beans from Burkina Faso. We imported every kind of green. It doesn't happen again. Now imagine with revenue having dropped, and international borders closed for about three months if we needed to import food. One, international borders were closed. We wouldn't be able to bring in food. Two, there's no money, no foreign exchange to even order that food. If the economy hadn't been diversified, agriculture, it would have been terrible for Nigeria. So see that other side of the coin. When you talk about oil prices going down, see what agriculture is doing for the country. And it was because President Muhammadu Buhari placed emphasis on Nigerians going back to the land. And not only just emphasizing it, he also funded it. He put his money where his mouth was. I would say that uh, that anchor borrower scheme that you mentioned, that, that they haven't benefited from it. Uh, how are we ensuring equitable distribution of that fund and also accountability? There are guidelines for keying into the anchor borrowers program. If people don't follow the guidelines, if some states don't follow the guidelines, they can't blame anybody. A lot of states are following it and they are reaping the dividends. When you key into it, there is a counterpart funding, there are some things you should do. When you do it, you get the reward and the dividend. So you can't sit back and begin to complain if your governors or your states don't do the necessary thing they should do. The guidelines are there for everybody to follow and to access that form. Still talking uh, on the economy, uh, the, the president is seeking a $5.513 billion uh, loan and uh, uh, Nigerians are concerned about uh, our rising debt profile, especially how it's going to impact on uh, human development. Uh, does this also concern you in any way, especially looking at its implications uh, moving forward? Uh, are we also looking at other options as uh, uh, such as uh, perhaps cutting the cost of governance, which a lot of Nigerians are also suggesting? Well, because uh, those who are suggesting it, Mr. Deshun, are you there?
All right, we've been speaking with uh, Mr. Femi Adishin of Special Advice uh, to the President of Media and Publicity, and he has been highlighting uh, key benefits or key developments that uh, the administration has uh, recorded uh, so far in the past uh, five years. Uh, we'll definitely get back to him to see uh, how we can continue uh, this conversation on TVC Breakfast uh, this morning. We'll take a break and return with more on the show. Just stay with us. You're watching TVC Breakfast. Uh, before we went on break, we were speaking uh, with uh, the special advisor to the president of media and publicity, Mr. Femi Adeshina. We have him back on now. All right, uh, Mr. Adeshina, we were talking, you were trying to talk to us about uh, cutting costs of uh, governance with regards to our uh, debt profile. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, I was saying that, yes, cutting cost of governance is good in any country, for any country. But in terms of savings, what does it amount to? There is no country that does not borrow. Even America, it borrows. But those who are complaining about borrowing only see one side of the coin. And like I said earlier, a coin has two sides. IMF has come out to say that Nigeria's borrowing is under control vis-a-vis -vis its GDP. Our own finance minister has also explained that Nigeria's GDP can accommodate those borrowings, particularly when you don't borrow to steal, when you don't borrow to pocket, when you borrow for development, you borrow for infrastructure, and your GDP can sustain that borrowing. Then there's nothing to worry about you find that those who complain about the country's borrowings are doing it out of politics. Politics, because they are looking for things to just oppose. That's why most of them do it. But in terms of can our economy, our gross domestic product, can it sustain that borrowing? Yes, it can. And even International Monetary Fund has borne testimony to that. Other Economic experts have said, yes, Nigeria can sustain that borrowing. As long as you borrow for development, it's something that will yield back for the country in future. But isn't that also affecting our budget performances, seeing about 70% of uh, our revenue is uh, always spent uh, on debt servicing? Well, when you borrow, you want service. Do you want, do you want to borrow and not pay back? Even the Bible says a wicked man borrows and doesn't pay back. No, when you borrow, you must pay back. And uh, uh, that, that paying back is not ad infinitum. When you finish, you finished paying. All right, let's move on now to the issue of uh, tackling corruption, which is also one of uh, the major uh, focus of uh, the government so far. A lot of Nigerians have uh, lauded uh, the government in its effort at uh, tackling corruption and also recovery of looted funds. But uh, that doesn't seem to uh, reflect uh, when you look at uh, the Transparency International's uh, index, uh, corruption index, perception index rather, of Nigeria. Nothing seems to have changed. How doesn't that worry the presidency? No, no, it should not, it should not worry the presidency, nor it should it worry anybody. We don't need external people to come and tell us about the performance of the government in fighting corruption. We know it. We feel it. We sense it. We see it. We see that it is happening. We know how many people have been sent to jail for corruption. We know how many people are on trial. We see that when you are indicted for corruption, you must answer for it. So we don't need any external organization, which maybe uh, is actuated by some other reasons to come and tell us that the thing is not working. Nigerians know it is working. We see that it is working. We feel that it is working. We know where we were in terms of anti-corruption, and we know where we are now. That is what matters. How about uh, the, the recovered uh, looted funds? Uh, some Nigerians are concerned about 
how this money is uh, spent. So perhaps uh, they're asking, maybe the government could make public how this money is I expended. Uh, should Nigerians hope that someday that would happen? No, that has always happened. The, the problem is that some people just hear what they want to hear. They see what they want to see. Every year in the budget, there is a subhead in the budget called recoveries. Recoveries. That is what takes care of looted funds that have been recovered. In the, in, the, in the budget of a certain year, it was used for infrastructure. It was there in the budget as recoveries. In another year, it was used on the social investment program. It was there as recoveries. Now the ones that got returned recently, the agreement is that it will be used for Lagos Ibadan Expressway, Abuja, Abuja Kano Expressway, and the second Niger Bridge. These things are clear. So those who keep asking questions, they should just also try to look at the budget closely. They will see a subhead called recoveries. That's what takes care of returned money to the country. All right, we see security issues keep rising despite uh, the government's uh, efforts uh, across uh, some states. Uh, I wonder how much effort uh, the government intends to put in uh, to address this situation. So much money has been put so far. Nigerians expect that a lot should have been achieved in its fight against insurgency, yet the war keeps raging. A lot has been achieved if you just want to accept it. For those who will refuse to accept, there is nothing you will say. But in terms of where the war is, a lot, a lot, a lot has been achieved. The war, particularly against the insurgency, is in its last gasp. You can't compare the state of that war with the way it used to be. There was a time that war, that war started from northeast. It went into northwest. It came into north central, including in the federal capital. There were bombings every day in the country. Do you hear these things again? There were bombings at bus stops, at mosques, at schools, at churches every day. Do you hear these things again? So it would be disingenuous to say not much has been achieved in terms of the war against insurgency. The truth is that a lot has been achieved. Yes, it's not concluded, but very soon it will be concluded. Recall that the, the, the chief of army staff went into the Northeast about six, eight weeks ago, and he told the country that he would not return till that war was concluded. Just two, three days ago, we were told that over a thousand insurgents have been killed in the past one or two weeks. The war is progressing. It will end. And one thing people who are saying this war uh, is not ending should realize is that it's, uh, it's in the entire Sahel. Look at Mauritania. Look at Burkina Faso. Look at Cameroon. Look at Libya. In the entire Sahel, these things are happening, and Nigeria uh, uh, receives an influx of those armed people from the, those other countries. But it does not mean that the gov government is not doing its best to tackle these security challenges. And I tell you, as night follows the day, these challenges will end. Very All right, soon. Let, let's quickly talk, touch on health matters now. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is said to have exposed the lapses in our health uh, sector. What are the plans of government to perhaps improve on this, especially to curb uh, uh, medical tourism? Not just in our health sector, in the entire global health sector. If you are talking of lapses in the Nigerian health sector, how about America? Over 100,000 dead. How about UK? I think death toll has crossed 30,000 in the UK. How about France? Also in the region of 30,000. How about Italy? How about Spain? These are four first world countries which have suffered devastation, far more than even Africa. Yes, our health infrastructure was poor, still remains poor. But one good thing is that after this pandemic, all the things that are springing up now, laboratories, isolation centers, special hospitals. When the pandemic is over, will these things be folded up? No, they will be there to the benefit of Nigeria and Nigerians. So, and the lesson is that any country must always be ready, must always be ready in terms of infrastructure, particularly 
health infrastructure. So Nigeria, I'm sure, has learned a lot. It will benefit a lot. All the donations coming from the private sector, coming from the international community, coming from the federal government, when those are properly used, and I believe they are being properly used, at the end of it all, those facilities will be for the people. Even in terms of human capital development, in terms of capacity of our, of our health professionals, those things that they have learned right. will remain with them and they will continue to use it for the benefit of Quickly, life. before we let you go, would like for you to clear the air on uh, the Madagascar's COVID organic receive. There's been so much controversy as to Nigeria being asked to pay or not to pay. Make us better understand what the situation is. Well, the secretary to the government of the Federation, who is the chairman of the presidential task force, has spoken on that matter, that those uh, medications were sent to Nigeria. No invoice was sent. Nigeria was not asked to pay, and Nigeria is not paying. That's what the SGF, who is chairman of the presidential task force, has said. And he is the one qualified to speak on it. And with regards to that, uh, that the shipment received? Yes, that donation from Madagascar. Yes. What's government plans? What does he intend to do with it? And seeing that now we have uh, potentially three uh, herbal or local cures uh, on the way. Hey, well, you know I'm not a member of that task force. We should leave the task force to handle that matter. Whatever I say now cannot be based on knowledge because right. I'm not a member of the task force. All right, Mr. Femi, additional special advisor to the president on media publicity. Thank you for speaking with us. Thank you. My pleasure.